Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Patrick Liu and I'm going to be your host for the Diabetes Survival Guide show. I'm the founder of the Diabetes Management Group where I am a fitness and wellness coach for people with type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. And this show will be a way to share the phenomenal stories about people with all forms of diabetes, healthcare professionals who work with people with diabetes, health and wellness coaches who work with people in this population and or caregivers and relatives with people with diabetes across the world. A little bit of a personal background for me as a show starter is I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes back in 2021 and made some modifications to my lifestyle and habits to successfully reverse it in 2022. However, that onset of me receiving pre-diabetes in 2021 triggered my memories of when my grandpa who passed away when i was a sophomore in high school from kidney failure secondary to his type 2 diabetes about the care that was misunderstood and not the greatest at that time so i want to provide this show as a way to explore the different spectrums of diabetes and healthcare professionals sharing their tips of what they've seen helpful in working with folks with them and then some things that weren't as helpful so that y'all can learn something. So thank you so much and we'll get started with the disclaimers and the show. Disclaimers. This show is not medical advice or a treatment plan and may contain sensitive and explicit content. It is intended for general education and demonstration purposes only. This content should not be used to self-diagnose or self-treat any health, medical, or physical conditions. Don't use this show to avoid going to your own healthcare professional or to replace the advice they give you. Consult with your healthcare provider before attempting anything you learned in this show. You agree to identify and hold harmless the creators of this material for any and all losses, injury, or damages resulting from any and all claims that arise from your use or misuse of this show material. The creators and guests of this show make no representations about the accuracy or suitability of this content. Use these materials at your sole risk. Views and opinions are individual to the creators and guests of this show and do not represent any other opinions or entities and are not intended to event anybody. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, how's it going everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Diabetes Survival Guide show. My name is Patrick, your host. I am a health and wellness coach currently working on my precision nutrition coaching certification and I'm a student physical therapist and today I am joined by an awesome amazing guest so I'm joined by Robert so Robert has done phenomenal things in the realm of Facebook by creating a support group for people with type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes to learn how they can best support each other share their journeys and how they are able to reverse their diagnosis and Robert has played a huge proponent in making sure that he's educated on the material as well. He took it upon himself to learn from healthcare providers, looking up research articles to figure out what is supported by the literature and evidence and applying that into his own life and then documenting and sharing his story with other people in the group and inspiring them to know that by making one small change in your life every single day, it'll get to the point where you could lose a lot of weight and feel super healthy and reverse type two diabetes. And additionally, being able to practice these positive habits, which would then inspire his family members, his loved ones to know that he's there for them and he is taking care of himself so that it can better provide for them. I'm happy to introduce Robert. Thank you so much for joining on the guest and feel free to introduce yourself for the things I haven't covered and tell us about your diagnosis story, if you don't mind. Absolutely. And it's an honor. Thank you for having me here, Patrick. I'm 58 years old. I, uh, Hispanic culture, which says a lot with diabetes and I'll, and I'll tell you in a bit, but I got diagnosed back. I want to say when I was about 32, which changed my life forever. Mm -hmm. And I, I was having issues. I've always been heavy. Didn't realize how weight played a huge part with diabetes but I've been heavy most of my life. I've yo-yo dieted many times and I've bounced right back up. I was having issues and I decided to go to the doctor and it turned out that I couldn't sleep extreme thirst. And every time I ate, I was still 
hungry. I went to the doctor and it turned out that I was diabetic and it changed my life. They checked my urine and it turned out that I was dumping the sugar. And that's a serious thing there. So basically the doctor told me that what you have to do is change your diet with no direction whatsoever and take 500 milligrams metformin and see you in three months. So all along, I was in denial because I, I didn't like checking my sugar because I don't like needles. I don't know who does. Oh. So yeah, so it, it was a hard test for me in my life. Fast forward, what happens here with the Hispanic culture here, Patrick, is it's very carbohydrate driven. I didn't mm -hmm. know what a carbohydrate was. So fast forward to five years ago, I said enough was enough because I went, I changed doctors to a very prominent doctor here locally, and he put me in a diet again. And the reason why is because when I went to go get checked, the guy told me point blank, my wife was there that my sugars were at 300, 400. My cholesterol was at five. Whoa. Five. My, my blood pressure was at, I don't know, I think it was 160. He says my cells were not round anymore. And he said, you need to change your life because you're not going to last five years. Just like that. And I was like, Jeez. oh, no. So that's when I said, Patrick, enough was enough. And mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to learn. I, I educated myself by research. I followed so many people. And that's where people tend to make a little bit of mistakes as to whom you want to follow, because there's a lot of false information out there, I'm sure. But I said enough was enough. And I said, I'm going to change my life. And I learned what foods to eat and how to eat in the order that of you're supposed to eat. And I just said, I've got to change my life. And that's when I realized that weight plays a huge part in insulin resistance, because I don't call it a sugar issue, right? I don't see it as a sugar issue. I see it as an insulin issue. We have an insulin issue. Somehow, throughout our lives, us and us diabetics, we've become, at a young age, we had our insulin performance high and our insulin resistance low. All through our lives, it crisscross. And now our insulin resistance is high and our insulin performance is low. And a lot of that has to do with how our body metabolizes our food because we have a metabolic disorder. That's exactly what it is. I said, okay, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn what foods to eat, how to eat, and how to lose weight. To be honest with you, as I was doing all this, I realized that I was looking for calories because when you eat a whole food nutrition, because that's all that I eat, it's nothing but whole food, you realize that you can eat more if you watch what you eat. I learned and I proved it. Everything that I read, I proved it with my body because that's the only way that I'm going to believe it is if I feel it. So I started cooking for myself and I cook for my wife. And all I do is cook all healthy foods. And I joined this group called uh, RGV Cookaholics. So I started posting about diabetes and people don't want to hear that. Yeah. Especially mm -hmm. here locally in the Hispanic culture, because to give you an example, and I'm hoping I'm not talk, talking too much. I'm very passionate. With no, this. you're good. Keep going. <laughs> uh, to give you an example is our plates in the Hispanic culture, right, is your little bit of protein and you have rice, potato salad, and beans. I triple the carbohydrates without even knowing because rice is extreme carbohydrate, but potato salad, but potatoes. And we all use in the Hispanic culture russet white potatoes. And then you have your beans. Of course, your beans are really good because they got a lot. One cup has 15 grams protein, 15 grams fiber, but it has 40 grams carbohydrate, but it doesn't do much to you because of the fiber and the protein content. Mm. So you've tripled up and that's what happens. And then that's what happened to me all my life because those are my favorite foods. Those are staple foods. So you tripled up and then you don't eat much protein. And guess what? You're hungry an hour later and you eat more. And that's where the calories start to grow and your midway starts to grow. I started posting and people really started liking my foods because I believe that your eyes is your success. Mm -hmm. If you make your foods very enticing, if you make your palate want it, you're not going to want to divert from your nutrition. I'm living proof. So one day I told my wife, I said, you know what? I'm going to start up a group in Facebook because I've become very passionate and I want to share this information with people. So I started a group three years ago, going on three years, actually two and a half years called Life as a Diabetic. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have worded it better, Life as a Diabetic. So fast forward again is I realized that exercise and 
watching your weight is key to beating and reversing diabetes. Can it be reversed? Yes, it can. Because I'm a 25 year, almost 26 year diabetic, heavily medicated, 2000 milligrams for most of those years. They wanted to put me on insulin until I said a no. And I did, and I did it myself. I've been med free for two years. Uh, it can be done. I can literally eat anything, but I choose not to. I've had my A1C at 4.9, 4.8 the first six months and 4.9 the second six months of last year, very strong. So I've proven that exercise medicinal because number one, for every 10% of skeletal lean muscle compared to your body weight is a 10% reduction of insulin resistance. And when you exercise, you don't need insulin. Why? Because your muscles are sponge takes that sugar out of your blood without the use of insulin. So that's how you basically how I control my diabetes along with nutrition. Yeah, that's pretty much in a nutshell what I've done with myself. And I'm very proud of myself. I follow so many people. It's just amazing. Protein. I follow Lay Norton. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he is an awesome guy. Lay uh, Norton. I'll have to add him onto my list of people that I follow because currently the folks really that I have to Patrick because he has a PhD and I think his thesis was in, in protein synthesis. Oh, really? So okay. The guy knows his stuff and he likes to debunk people. And that's what mm-hmm. I, because it gives people a direction of where to go and where not to go. Yeah. Uh-huh. But, that's awesome that you're taking the time to, to search out the information that's out there and test what the literature is saying, what the research is out there is saying, and then implementing into your own life and proving that, hey, this stuff works, as well as learning that some of the people who are out on the social media space, like learning that the misinformation that's out there and being able to debunk that and being living proof that, hey, there's a reason why science exists. And there's a reason why we have these research articles that based off of science exist is because it works for the majority amounts of people. And of course, there might be some outliers of that bell curve that may not fall along with it. But generally, everyone tends to respond well by adjusting their diet so it optimizes their ability to improve their metabolism instead of introducing so many foods into it that if you force your body to metabolize so many times, it's like a tire where if you keep on driving without getting that tire replacement and that tire replacement, I would say it's exercise, adding more lean muscle to your mass. That's your tire change to help with keeping your tires maintained. If one just goes about without exercising and not adjusting their diet. So it's more optimized for it. It's literally driving those tires until it has no tread. Then one day it starts to snow. And then of course, since your tire has no treads driving in that snow, it just slips off the road and it plows and it's just not a great time. And that car with that situation, imagine that is your body. So by being able to exercise and utilizing that muscle and building that muscle too, so that your body is able to utilize those blood sugars more effectively and feel stronger as well as having the appropriate diet so that you feel fuller for longer with the additional proteins and increasing the amount of fiber you're able to go a lot longer feeling fuller, feeling more satisfied. And I'm not sure about y'all's, but when I was diagnosed with prediabetes and even now, like my hunger pains, it's not a good mental space. Cause you're like, crap, when's the next meal coming? I'm looking for exactly. a vending machine. I'm looking for any sorts of exactly. opportunities to munch on something. And it really affects the mind. It really affects the body, not in a great time, but instead if one feels satisfied and filled up, That is a great feeling. I love feeling that I feel full, I feel satiated, and I'm ready to go along with my day. So I really love how you highlighted those facts and for sharing your story, as well as being able to say that you're medication free for two years now. Like that's a huge accomplishment and showing that for someone who has had diabetes since you were in your thirties to now being diabetes free in current age that you're in now, like it's it shows that anything is possible when you have the right motivators and the right support system there to do that. And now having that Facebook group, which is now over what, 7,000 people who's in there, almost 8, which is almost 8,000. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's insane. And being able to continually support them through their journey and process and being able to combat the misinformation that would be put out there by having this Facebook community and sharing it on there. That's 
for me, it's very powerful. <laughs> yeah, and we're very science based. I mean, we yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> very science based. We don't go by hearsay. We don't go by social media doctors or anything like that. We go by science because at the end of the day, that's exactly what people don't understand that. And I see a lot of people that they're so avid on saying this social media doctor is correct. Show me the meta-analysis. Show me all the control trials. Show me where it, they've done all these tests on humans, not rats, humans. And that that's basically where a lot of people make very huge, drastic mistakes. It's hard. It's very difficult. Yeah. But, and it's also the same thing, too, for some doctors that do post, oh, go the carnivore diet or go the keto diet. Now, I'm not trying to bag on those diets that are over there. But if we take a step back and look at it, if someone does adopt the carnivore diet, like one knows that, uh, and if you don't know, then you have a great learning opportunity here where by intaking more of those red meats, they tend to have higher amounts of saturated fats. And those higher amounts of saturated fats, that could actually increase one's cholesterol and increasing the risk of heart disease, stroke, and other cardiovascular diseases that Sure, maybe adopting that carnivore diet is great. However, the type 2 diabetes may be reversed, but it could increase the risk of developing other diseases instead. And I really like how your community is really science-based and driven because there's a lot of posts that are being done on some of the content that I'm putting out there right now for the current 100-day challenge that I'm in and posting tips on how someone can manage their type 2 diabetes is like, oh, you can get rid of your type 2 diabetes by taking one herbal supplement pill and it'll oh, cure your type yeah. 2 diabetes, it'll cure your herpes, it'll cure literally everything. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, okay, instead of saying that's not true, let's look at the research articles that are out there. I looked at the research articles, guess what? It's not there. <laughs> yeah. And I want to add on I want to add on something there, Patrick. Uh, but go ahead. And because you brought something up that's so important. And because I see a lot of this on my page is people are fighting because they're not fighting, but they're fighting with themselves because they cannot stick to a diet. Well, here's what the thing is. I don't have a problem. Like, like you say, I have no problems with keto, no problems with carnivore, paleo, none. The diet that you should stick to is one that you can sustain yourself on lifetime because and have a balance and have a, as much protein as you can but have it lean and people don't understand why lean because you can incorporate the good fats because fats and the PUFA, MUFA, and those are good fats. Mm -hmm. Saturated fats, yes. And that, and there's one thing that I'm gonna add on to what you said. It's the, one of the biggest culprits for insulin resistance, but we do need saturated fat, especially for us men for hormone health. So everything has a balance. So what I tell all my members is, okay, why do we have lean proteins? So you can incorporate good fats. Fats weigh nine calories per gram. Proteins and carbohydrates weigh only four. You see where I'm going to this? You can very easily overeat and you can over consume calories eating too many fats that you can go over your calories and then you'll start to gain a little bit of weight. And that's where we need to be very careful. Everything has a balance. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it. But stick to a diet that you can sustain yourself long term. That's the key there. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what diet. As long as you get your micronutrients, your minerals and vitamins and all that stuff, that's all that matters. Yeah, that's I totally matters. agree there. Whatever diet sticks with you. And there's one entrepreneur who's out there. He's prominent in the business industry and health and wellness and fitness industry. His name is Alex Hormazi. And for folks, they can see like this guy is huge. Like he's lean muscle and everything. And what does his diet compose of? eating 200 grams of protein every single day, whether that's in the form of steaks or turkey or chicken, just something like that. And then he fills up the additional calories that he would need to sustain his body with cakes, cookies, like all those different sweets. But the thing about it is he pairs eating the proteins at the same time while he's eating those sweets so that he's able to sustain that ability to have the appropriate responses where his body is able to appropriately metabolize them well. And for the nutrients that he doesn't have, because for some people, maybe if they don't like vegetables or if they're allergic to certain forms of vegetables, that's when supplementation can come in the, right there. And exactly. it's like diet comes first. And then once that diet is like you did as much as you can with it, then we can look into that supplementation of 
what things are lacking for your diet because that's what supplements are for. It's just to fill in the holes that the diet doesn't cover. And I feel like there's plenty of folks that are out there, unfortunately, where they're thinking, what supplements should I take versus what diet should I like? How can I learn how to read a nutrition label so that I can actually get it from my diet versus trying to figure out what the next supplement is to address their situations? Exactly, Patrick. Very, very well said. Yes. Yeah, we are. I love, I'm loving this conversation and I'm hopeful that our audience who's tuning into it too is also learning a lot from this as well. And for those who don't quite know, carbohydrates, that's like the form of sugars that one's body is able to digest down. So carbohydrates, it equals sugars. However, some carbohydrates such as fiber, that's not digestible. So that means that helps with improving our body's ability to digest things slower and by having that slower process with it, our body is able to spend more time actually absorbing the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients from it instead of having that insane spike in that blood sugar in responses to it. So that's why, as Robert said, with the beans, having that high fiber intake, that helps a lot and that helps significantly. Exactly. There is that. Exactly. Yeah. And then for the PUFAs and the MUFAs that Robert talks about for an educational bit, for those who don't know, the Robert, did you want to take this? Did you want to share your knowledge oh, yeah, of that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> PUFA is polyunsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats, remufa. Those are good fats. That's what stimulates our insulin sensitivity. Remember, we don't have a sugar issue. We have an insulin issue. As we've gotten, while you're trying to lose the weight, this is the way I see it. While you're trying to lose the weight, there are mechanisms that you can do to increase the insulin sensitivity while your body is decreasing the body fat so that your body can increase its naturally its insulin sensitivity. To do that, it's highly recommended to consume polyunsaturated fats and you get into extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, gotta be careful because it's very calorically dense. It's 120 calories per tablespoon, but it's got a mm -hmm. whopping 14 grams of unsaturated fat. You can get it through salmon, which is the best, literally the best fish in the planet. You've got a whirl, a plethora, literally of, goodness in salmon. There's many ways that you can get unsaturated fat because keep in mind, that is what increases our insulin sensitivity. It's good for cardiovascular. It's good. It's good to lose weight. It's mm -hmm. the fattiest fish in the planet, but it, but you actually lose weight eating it. But that's basically what uh, poofas and mufas are. It's unsaturated fat. There's unsaturated and there's saturated. And I'm going to, if I could just real quick, I had my cholesterol, as I told you, really high. And remember, I told you that I like to prove certain things with my own body. Mm -hmm. A year and a half ago, I was still in meds, I believe. And I had my, my cholesterol at about 130. So I said, you know what? Okay. I count my macros, like change in my pocket, literally. And it's just become a part of my life. So I realized that I was eating 10% of saturated fat, 10% of my total daily calories. According to research, 20 to 30% of your daily calories should come from fats. It's good for hormone health. No more than 10% should come from saturated. So I was eating like maybe 11, 12%, 13%. So I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to drop it to five. So I dropped it to five. And guess what? My cholesterol is under 100. So mm -hmm. it's true. So what I'm saying is that if you balance your whole nu nutrition, you'd be surprised what your body will do. Your body knows exactly what to do with the stuff that you give it, you know? So I just wanted to just add on to that in, in terms of fat. But fat is a very good thing, but it's a good, a too much of a good thing can be bad. Of course, like too much of a good thing, too little of a good thing. Like it's finding that right balance appropriately. Exactly. You know how I say it on my, on my page, it's everything has a balance. Everything has a balance. Everything in moderation. Yes. Uh, I totally agree. Because if some person wants to have their... Like if they're really wanting something that's high in saturated fats for one day, like a really fatty Wagyu steak, then yeah, totally. Once in a while isn't going to hurt you. Just also, hurt. yeah, exactly. Be able to treat yourself for those other factors. It's also then figuring out what else can I do to improve that? So like eating some more fiber that's on the side and then also supplementing or eating things that has the polyunsaturated fats or the monounsaturated fats. And for me in particular, like, I actually supplement for some of my omega-3s, which is 
a form of the polyunsaturated fats and the monounsaturated fats is with cod liver oil. And that one, it like, I found also a lot of cognitive benefits as well. And when I say cognitive benefits, it's the mental clarity that I'm receiving from it. And I have significantly less brain fog with it. And I also think that it supports with liver health as well. So it's like by treating your body right and appropriately, everything else just seems to fall in line with it, which is awesome. And feeling great, like nothing can beat that. <laughs> exactly, Patrick. Exactly said, sir. So the next thing I want to ask you, Robert, is what has been your greatest success in managing your diabetes and your greatest success in supporting someone else with managing their diabetes from the support group? My greatest success would be, I would have to say exercise and actually having fun combining your foods with, with terms to your nutrition. But I would say it would be exercise and you don't have to, when it comes to nutrition, you don't have to, the way I, I count all my macros, people don't have to do that. They really don't. I, I just do it right for my own sake. But sensible eating is what is key. A well-balanced meal, careful with the carbohydrates, as much fiber and protein as you can. But I would say that my biggest success would be exercise is one of the, it's king to me. That's just me, right? In terms of a member of my group, I'm going to tell you one. I had a girl that became a member a couple of years ago, and she said her story, right? As, as most people do. And she had her sugars at a thousand. And I was what? Like, oh my God, a thousand, Patrick. No way. So I said, you know what? And she was a young girl. She was like 27 years old. So I reached out to her because she sounded very, and I hate to use this word, but very illiterate with diabetes. She didn't know anything. So I reached out to her. I said, you know what, Robert, I'm the, from uh, Life is Diabetic and I want to help you out. Oh my God, Mr. Gonzalez, I'm so happy that because I've just been so scared. So she told me a little bit of her story. She said that she went into the hospital because she was feeling faint. Her mom took her. And they checked her, her blood. It turned out that she was at a thousand. So they had to induce coma. So she oh, wow. was in induced coma for about four or five days, came out and they got, they were able to get it down to like about 500. So I asked her, do you know what a glucometer is? No. Okay. It's a little machine, go to Walmart. And we're doing all this through messenger. And I said, I'm, whatever questions you have in terms of food, nutrition label, whatever, I'm here. So I, uh, look, I just want to cry. <laughs> Because it's so emotional because I saw this girl literally dying. I'm not saying it's because of me. I just gave her a gentle push. That's all I did. So I saw this girl going from 1,000 to a month later, 129 on her glucose. Really? Uh, yes, sir. And it was just basically just very carefully watching what she ate. I told her, I want you to check your sugars in the morning before lunch, before dinner. I want to see how your body performs because your morning glucose that that's a dawn phenomenon. That's everybody's sugar rises and people don't understand. They get all paranoid. Don't get paranoid. Just do what you have to do throughout the day. There's nothing you can do it while you're asleep, but there's a lot you can do while you're awake. So I explained to her about the dawn phenomenon. And I told her the ones that I'm very concerned about are the ones before lunch and before dinner. So she would send me all three readings and there's, and I could see them starting to go down. And I explained to her about the combination of foods and how to eat. And she was just the happiest person in the world. And that made me feel so good because I know firsthand how detrimental it can be. We've already lost two members. So I know how serious it can be. So that would be my biggest accomplishment. Huge by far, by far. Yes, that was a big one. And she's there every now and then and she'll message me, tell me she's doing great. And it's just amazing. It makes you feel really great inside. I, like I said, Patrick, earlier, I've become very passionate with this disease because I know what it can do. And I know what we as a human being can do. It's a road that people want to take and it's their choice. There's nothing you can do if they don't want to take that road. Yeah, I am getting so many chills right now. And I'm super grateful that you've had the opportunity to reach out and work with her. And the reason why I'm very mindful about my words. I didn't say help. I said worked with her. And the reason why I chose worked with her is because of the active components that people are able to work with each other, collaborate with each other to achieve the lifestyles and goals that they're wanting to 
do. And I feel like the word help, it's more of a handout situation where, oh, I helped this person. I'm like, I could say that I helped many people, but for me, that doesn't bring as much satisfaction as saying I worked with them. Like I was able to see their progress from point A to point B to point C to D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, N, O, P, all the way up to Z. And I feel like for help, it's like I helped this person get from point A to point B and that's it. And there's no follow up or consistency afterwards and work with it's like the difference between teaching somebody how to take control of their lives versus giving them something that could benefit them and support them but if you just give somebody a tool and they don't know how to use a tool then that is essentially useless to them but instead if you show them the tool and teach them how to use it and the different ways of how to go about it that collaborative approach that mentorship approach and that ability to work with them it as in my opinion, Robert, I feel like you work together so that she can learn how to save her own life and you empower her to be able to do that. So exactly. it's like a mutual, that mutual ability to save each other person's lives and then have that positive ripple effect later on. And exactly. yeah. And additionally for me, the things that I want to share, I'm not, uh, for those of you who haven't tuned into the prior episodes and learned a little bit about my story, my grandfather mm-hmm. he passed away from type 2 diabetes and oh my word. yeah and i like he passed away when i was a sophomore in high school and i saw the progression of him having to go through type 2 diabetes being put on dialysis that fatigue afterwards and the pain that he felt whenever he came back from his dialysis treatments and the extreme fatigue when i was a sophomore in high school i didn't quite know the severities or understandings of it i just thought oh he's getting old that's it so now i realized that No, there are some people who are 110 year olds who are hiking the Grand Canyon, doing it amazingly, having fun, not a single form of discomfort with their bodies whatsoever, because they decided to take care of it and take control of it. And for me, just seeing that reality change and the perspective shift of realizing that, no, we can do so much more than we're capable of. And by educating ourselves how to take care of it appropriately, And then working with others to achieve their same goals and accomplishments that sure, some folks, maybe they're good where they're more independent and they could do it just fine. Or some other people, maybe that involves reaching out and getting some help. Or if someone needs to take that extra step and investing into health and wellness coaches or investing into a dietitian or those other services for more of that extra level, then yeah, there's different tiers that someone can go through it. And in my opinion, it's like, there's no price to pay that's greater than the investment that you would make into yourself. Because uh, coming from some of my clinical rotations as a student physical therapist, I'm seeing people come in and they're literally losing their limbs through amputations because of their type two diabetes or the unregulated control of that. (laughs) Honestly, the amputations, I think there was a statistic by the American Diabetes Association that 80% of amputations from people with type 2 diabetes and prediabetes is preventable if they would do daily foot inspections. And if we understand that, it's like, whoa, just checking your feet every single day, like morning and night, just to see how that is. And then adding motion if needed to save my foot, like that to me is how crazy the lack of education there is out there and the importance of it. And that's why I'm very passionate about providing those different tiers and options for people where if someone is wanting some of the more of those free resources, then I'm providing content on, on Facebook, on social media platforms, and also working with you in the Life as a Diabetic Facebook support group, just providing educational content that way where it's free for those who are like they're okay and they have that ability to use what they can from those free services now for those who are wanting more of that personalized care or if they don't want to do as much of that thinking per se and they want to invest into some coaching services then i also have the option too for people who want more of that personalized approach and just by being able to have that realm of if you're okay with that, uh, spending the time doing the research yourself independently, there's that for you. But if you're willing to pay for that speed and going through there, then here's these other awesome like services and offers that can best support whatever your needs are. And just being able to have that open space because I've seen the downsides and the aspects that comes with it. And 
on one of our past episodes, we actually had a physical therapist who specializes in working with people with amputations and majority of them have type two diabetes. And once that amputation occurs, the diabetes doesn't go away. And now it's just trying to figure out how can we manage all of those so that we can prevent further amputations along the line and still improving one's life and returning back into the things that they enjoy and love. And for me, it's like, we only get one body and why not make the best out of it and invest into it? Because it's going to cost significantly more by making the choices that will eventually lead to having that heart attack or that stroke versus maybe paying the extra funds right now to invest into your own health right now. And in my opinion, by investing into your health, you feel a lot more energized. And if you feel great, that means that improves your ability to do more work, to invest in yourself more and improving your productivity that you can probably make more money and outweigh the costs that's associated with investing into yourself, in my opinion. Exactly, Patrick. <laughs> Very well said. Exactly. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to this podcast. And before we continue with the rest of this show, I wanted to let y'all know, please feel free to give this podcast a five-star rating. If you like it, share it with other folks that you think it'd be beneficial for. And if you haven't already, feel free to subscribe and follow to the diabetes management group for awesome tips to manage your type two diabetes or pre-diabetes and let's get back to the show yeah all right so pivoting now robert what would you say has been the hardest moment since your diagnosis and some of the hardest moments that you've seen inside of the life as a diabetic group and what did you learn from each of those lessons and moments oh my god <laughs> When I got diagnosed is when I told you that my life changed, it did. And I'm going to tell you why, because I'm a foodie. The food mm -hmm. has become, food has always been something very big with me. Uh, so when I got diagnosed and I was told that I couldn't no longer eat those foods, I would go into the restaurant. You didn't have much of an option in terms of healthy foods on the, these Mexican restaurants that I used that I just love. I would walk into those restaurants and just wonder why can I not eat those foods? I was, I felt that I was cursed. I, I, that's the way I felt because, and I would cry because it's, I really would try to manage this diabetes and I couldn't. And I, I really tried and I would just start to cry because I just couldn't eat them anymore. And I think to be honest with you now, I feel like I've been gifted this disease from God. Why do I say this, Patrick? Because I've been able to show people what I've done with my body. I've been able to show people that you can reverse it. I've seen so many lows in our members and I've seen so many highs. And they're always telling me if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't, no, it, I appreciate it, but it's not me. I just give people a gentle push. You did it on yourself. You made that choice to say, enough is enough because at the end of the day if we don't take care of ourselves it's going to consume us and something can people don't understand that diabetes is a sugar issue yes but within our bodies blood runs through every crevice of our body and what what is in our blood sugar what goes through our kidneys livers eyes toes fingers blood what's in our blood sugar and people don't understand that, that you have to get, everything has a balance. Everything has a balance. Your sugar has a balance. We only need one, I think it's what, a half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of sugar in our entire blood? I don't remember. I think it's a teaspoon or half a teaspoon. That's all we need. So if you're eating so many carbohydrates, you're giving yourself a sugar load. You know, I'm not saying you can't eat it. I'm just saying just to watch what you eat. But I think that the lowest part in my life was when I would walk into restaurants and look around and say, why can I eat these foods anymore? But now I've made a choice and I feel like I've been gifted this disease and I don't have a problem living with diabetes at all. It's a mindset change to a healthier you. And I've seen some lows, like as I told you, I've seen some lows and I've had members cry to me through texts and 
telling me that her, my, my life is about to end. I've had members telling me they wanted to end their lives because they can't handle diabetes. Now, that's sad. You have to be their little coach there, and they're very grateful for it. But I thought that would be my lowest in, in, in terms of diabetes. But I just want to add to that, Patrick, is that we make our own destiny. We choose what we want. It's like that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can mm -hmm. only do so much. And I've learned that because I it has bothered me when I really want to help somebody, one of the members, and they don't, not that they don't do what you tell them, but they're not making the initiative. They're not just putting forward that foot and saying, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do my 10 minute walk after I eat. I'm going to do my exercises or whatever, but, and it bothers me and there's nothing I can do about it. There is, I'm trying to educate everybody. And that's why I put my before and after pictures to give them inspiration, to tell them you can do it. You can mm -hmm. lose weight. It's not difficult. I did it at 56 years old. I'm 58 right now. Age is just a doggone number if you think about it, right? It's what we do with it. So that's what I would have to say to that. But yeah, it's, there's some, a lot of lows. When you have a Facebook group and you've got almost 8,000 minds, it's sometimes, Patrick, it can be overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that, With a, especially since you moderate what people post on there. So I'm just like, and, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And we've got, I think, 12 moderators and I'm looking into getting some more because we're trying to be very, we want the group to be as healthy as we want ourselves to be because that old thing, garbage in, garbage out. That's why we're science-based. It's what science says. So we have to be very careful with the people posting and people coming in. So that's why we screen every post because we want everybody to get the highest quality information highest quality foods, highest quality, and, and, and anything, because really it, it's, we're dealing with people's lives for God's sakes. So mm -hmm. if we can touch their life by helping them just one more, one more day to eat a little bit more healthier or what have you, that's enough for me. But yeah, that would be my lowest and highest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's Absolutely. very powerful. And thank you so much for sharing that. I'm like I'm tearing up as well whenever you say yeah. the walking into the restaurants that you love and realizing that I can't have the foods that I love what why not and then being able to dig in and figure out how can I make the changes in my life so I would be able to incorporate the things that I do love and if it just looks different in a little bit of the ways then that's certainly okay and then being able to share your highs and lows with people inside of the group and take that inspiration and showing them that, Hey, it can be done as a young 58 year old guy who's had diabetes for so long. And I think the biggest thing that I want to touch on as well is how you mentioned that perspective change from now being grateful for type two diabetes, because that has now given you the strength to then inspire others who have been in those other situations to learn what is possible and that the disease doesn't define you. Instead, by making those small little choices, one is able to become a new person. And that new person is that new identity they have of becoming a healthy person because they deserve all those healthy choices that are getting into them. And I really love it how you have 12 moderators with you in order to make sure that the information that is being posted on there is supportive of what the literature is saying, what the evidence is saying, as well as even now, shameless plug for myself, the small lifestyle <laughs> tips that I'm able to share, y'all's being able to share that and publish that, just other ways that's outside of the realm of diet and exercise, because even small lifestyle factors too can play a huge role in it. Like, I think the post that I made today for, I think it was like day six of my 100 day challenge, like installing blackout curtains. And utilizing that, that can improve sleep and therefore improving sleep can significantly improve blood sugar control. It increases insulin sensitivity and that can just be indirect ways of doing so. As well as even having those blackout curtains as well, it could save money for the electricity bill because it's able to block out some of that sun rays to keep your house more cooler or prevent the heat from coming out for some of those windows and helps insulate it that it like you save money, you improve your health and 
what's there not to love? And you feel a lot better with it too. So I'm just like, also, what other ways can we serve and support folks in maybe some other ways that they haven't even thought of and maybe investing into something now, which then will lead to saving a lot more money and improving one's ability to make more money in the future too, to then further invest into themselves and having this positive like cycle, which is awesome. Yes. And uh, yeah. And one thing that I did want to touch on and point on too, is for the people who don't know, our brain, its main fuel source is sugars. So sugars isn't the enemy. It's the insulin resistance and how our body isn't as able to respond as well to insulin. That's the issue. So for those folks that are saying that, oh, get rid of sugars, do all these things. For some folks, like maybe the no carbohydrate, like the keto diet or the carnivore diet and everything. Yeah, it may be helpful and putting someone in the state of ketosis and that's great for them. But for some people, if their hunger pains is at the point where they cannot stand the transition from getting into the state of ketosis, where their body, their brain runs more on ketones, then that could be a huge issue in that situation as well. So it's like, for some people, the blood sugars may actually be supportive in that. It's just a matter of making sure how can we keep that balance? Because as Robert said before, too much of a good thing, not so good. Too much of a little thing, not so good. Instead, what's that balance that we could find to then have like exponential benefits and rewards for us? There's something I want to touch base with. I want to add on to that, Patrick. And this is in terms of that infamous keto diet, right? Yeah. Because there's a lot of people, these keto zealots, and I hate to say it that way, but it's true that they mm -hmm. say that, and it's, and you, you touched on that in terms of balance, because they say that you cannot, you cannot spike your insulin because if you spike your insulin, you're going to get fat. The first thing I would say, and the first thing that I've done that I have said in the past, I said, okay, could you please explain to me? And I take a screenshot and, or my pictures and I would post it on the comments. Can you please explain to me how I'm able to eat 225 grams daily of carbohydrates and go from 50% body fat to 9.5% body fat, spiking my insulin and crickets. Yes, insulin is a fat storage hormone. Yes, but you touched on something very important, balance. Everything has a balance. Okay, it's that infamous calorie in, calorie out. And I, and there again, I proved it because my before and after pictures, it's a calorie in, calorie out. In order to sustain a low A1C is to have three solid meals. Yeah, you're going to spike. Everybody's sugar spikes. Ours is a little bit more dramatic, but if you have three satiating meals, you won't want to snack. So what's going to happen? You're going to drop. And if you take that 10 minute walk after your meals, because that helps you metabolize. Remember, we have a met mm -hmm. metabolic disorder. And if you take those 10-minute walks after your meals, guess what? Your glucose is going to drop. And your insulin sensitivity typically is most sensitive in the afternoons and throughout the night. And I see it on my CGM. What I'm saying is that high-carb breakfast, I don't want to say the word high-carb. If you want carbohydrates, it, you get some good carbohydrates like rescue potatoes or whatever. I don't want to go too much into detail about food. <laughs> but if you have your moderate carbohydrates, breakfast and lunch, and you have a low carbohydrate dinner, right? And you exercise, let's say four o'clock before dinner, then you have your dinner. I assure you, your glucose is going to be very stable. So it's all a balance issue. Yeah, insulin is a fat storage hormone. Yes, it is. I'm not going to deny it, but if it's a balance. Your body is constantly, Patrick, is constantly storing fat burning fat, storing fat, burning fat. At the same time, it's mm -hmm. that balance. So if you keep your proteins up high, because the thermic effect of protein is like between 20 and 30%, if people don't know what that is, as an example, for every thousand calories, you're burning two to 300 calories, just digesting the food for God's sakes. So that's mm -hmm. the win-win situation there. The thermic effect of carbohydrates is only three to 7%. Thermic effect of fats only, I think it's a half a percent or a half 1%, I don't remember. But what I'm saying is if you strategize and you get your avocado for your good fats and you get your 300 grams of lean chicken breast and you get some broccoli, asparagus, whatever kind of cruciferous vegetable you want, right? Or any vegetable, you've made a very well-balanced plate. So I'm sorry, Petra. I can go on and on. <laughs> no, no need to be sorry. Thank you for going on and yeah. going into detail. It really shows the audience members how 
passionate and how much you care about this subject and details and wanting to mm-hmm. serve other people by this. And I know for me, I'm benefiting from learning these things as well and yeah. having it as a refresher as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And for the audience members that are thinking, like, why is it that by building muscle and like having more of that muscle that we're able to burn more calories? If we think about it this way, what's the purpose of muscles? Like it's supposed to move and stabilize our joints. So if we have more muscles, that means we are like, think about it this way. Imagine that for somebody who has not lifted up any sorts of weights at all, they're pretty skinny or scrawny and they just don't have a lot of muscle mass with them. Imagine that person having an army of 10 people compared to someone when they decide to work out in the gym, doing some strength training and being able to gain more muscle mass. Now that they have more muscles, imagine that now they have a larger amounts of people in their army. Now they have 50 people in their army. So it's like thinking about it this way, if that skinny scrawnier version of them has 10 people to feed versus the pe- person who has more muscles where they have 50 people to feed, I think it, now that the blood sugars are in your body, since you have more muscles right there and you have 50 people to feed, then that's just going to make it a lot easier for one's body to regulate those blood sugar levels and keeping those muscles happy and being able to stabilize the joints, making one feel a lot stronger and feel better and move it along with it. So hopefully that has, that information tip is helpful for, for folks of understanding why, like how building muscle can affect one's ability to burn more calories and also improving insulin sensitivity and improving their blood sugar control in the long run. Absolutely, Patrick. Very well said. Perfect analogy, actually. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So pivoting now, what would be one piece of advice you would share to yourself when you were first diagnosed? And what would it be? Oh, my God. (laughs) I wish I knew everything back then. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Honestly, Patrick, I wish I would have educated myself back then. But see, but here's the thing. 26 years ago, diabetes was very different. Exactly. I mean, I, what I mean by that, it's a, it's, a, it's the same disease, but our knowledge was very different. So, yeah, I would have said my nutrition, but there again, it was very different back then. Very mm-hmm. different. So, yeah, that would be have been my best answer for me would be my nutrition because that's key. Your food is key. And walk and move and don't just become a couch potato because that's exactly the way I was. Yeah. I didn't want want to walk. That's very sedentary life. Mm -hmm. Now I can't, I can't get myself to sit down. (laughs) Yeah. uh I I really can't. We become, my wife and I are hikers. We're going to go to Colorado this next couple of weeks and we go to the mountains and yeah, (laughs) we, we go hiking up there and that's, we just love doing that. We're those 15, 18, 20,000 steps. That puts a toll on your glucose. Believe me. Oh, and there's research articles too that says getting 10,000 steps a day and 15,000 steps a day and 20,000 steps a day, that significantly increases one's ability to live a higher quality life by living longer. So you're feeling healthier and you live longer and reducing all risk of disease and mortality. So heart disease, kidney disease, brain disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, like every single factor with that. By getting 10,000 steps a day to 20,000 steps a day, it drastically reduces it a lot. If you think about it, Patrick, we were not designed to uh, sit down. We're exactly. designed to walk. We're mm-hmm. wired to walk. That's why we have two legs. Uh huh. That's a really good, yep, that's a very good point. Mm-hmm. Very true. Yeah. And also, I wanted to say as well that there's even more research articles that are saying that, yeah, a 10-minute walk's good. What's better than a 10-minute walk after a meal? A 15 to 20-minute walk. So it's like, yeah, it's like, and of course doing what you can. And for some folks who may not be able to go on walks after a meal, even doing a sit to stand. So for those of you who don't know what a sit to stand is, imagine yourself sitting in a chair Like you could feel the handlebars right next to you. You could feel the comfort of that chair. You could smell the environment in your house. And all you need to do is squeeze your leg muscles, tighten up that core, lean a little bit forward and sit up, then sit back down. Do that for 30 seconds, just as much as you can. And that can actually significantly improve blood sugar scores too, because 
Now your body is able to work and activate those muscles. So now you're feeding those soldiers, as I talked about in the analogy before, by using those muscles, you're feeding those muscles. And by going on walks, that's the same thing too. And the more you're able to feed those muscles, the more the blood sugar levels are able to reduce down and improve the insulin sensitivity and improve overall health and well-being. Exactly. Exactly. Patrick. There's alternatives. If you don't like walking, that's okay. I just gave you another alternative. <laughs> now, as, now, as far as walking, just so people know, and you said 20 minute walk because my, after my lunch, it's always 20 minute walk for me. It's one mile for every minute of walking. You drop one, one point of glucose for every minute of walking. You drop one point. So if you walk 20 minutes and that's just an average. Sometimes I've dropped 60, 70 points in 20 minutes. It just depends on how intense I want to jog. Do I want a brisk walk? Do I want a casual walk? But yeah, for every minute, it's an average of one point per minute of glucose. I think for me, when I wore my continuous glucose monitor and I went on 20 minute walk, I think I went from like a, like a score of 180 for my blood sugar spike and it dropped down to... I think it was 80. I think that's like a hundred points right there. And yes, sir. But yeah, just doing that 20 minute walk. And I felt like I, I was putting on a podcast so that I can distract myself from it and just let time fly by. And even in reality too, if we take a step back, there's also a huge hormonal effect that happens for blood sugar regulation. If one is feeling stress, then cortisol, that can actually increase blood sugar levels because that can blunt the response of blood sugars being able to transport into the cells in your body and the muscles and everything that it just keeps it more elevated so by being able to put oneself in more of a relaxed state one can actually see improvements in their blood sugar scores and if you pair that with walking at the same time where you're listening to something that's relaxing whether that's some relaxing music or listening to a podcast that one enjoys or an audiobook and going on for a walk like you could have dramatic effects in improving your blood sugar levels. And of course, for granted, like if it drops to the point where it gets super low, always have some of those high sugary snacks just in case to combat those blood sugar lows. And the last thing that we need is dropping it so it's so low that one ends up experiencing a hypoglycemic episode or a low blood sugar episode where now their body starts shutting everything down and that's not a good time either. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, time and place for everything, like high sugary foods. And in the situation where one is having a hypoglycemic episode, it's a perfect time to have that sugary snack. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks again for sharing the thoughts and feedbacks for taking steps. And this question that I want to ask too, I always ask this for all the people who come onto this show is what is your zombie apocalypse survival plan? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, because we're going to be in it for the long haul. Yeah. Uh huh. We're going to be in it for the long haul. Number one, I would say my household and most important, water, foods that you really can't cook because you're going to need foods that, you know, that can stay in a good state for months at a time. And just be strong. That's all you can do. Strategize. What are you going to do? But just stay, keep hydrated and just keep foods because food is the primary food and water. We have to have it. And you have to have your house. So mm -hmm. your homestead and, and food is, would be, I would have to say, strategize on what kind of foods that I can have that are like not perishable food and uh, stay hydrated. That would be the best answer I can give you there, Patrick, because that's something that I don't want to think about, but, <laughs> but, then, but then who does and who does, man? Oh uh, Lord. I think it's time and, for us to bust out the agriculture books to learn how to farm, <laughs> grow our own food. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go to organic now, man. We have to real, that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast episode that I had last week, from the recording of this one, I actually have the person who's founded an organization called Cultiva International, and he's actually in charge of educating people in the Guatemalan community on how to sustain a garden box and grow their own fruits or grow their own vegetables and spices and learning how to cook with them. So when I asked him what the zombie apocalypse survival plan was, y'all definitely take a look and 
hear the podcast episode from last week for that. His was like, he already had the whole setup down. Like he knows how to grow his own food. He has a community, like a bunch of community people who know how to tend to the gardens and have farms and crops and everything that they're fine whenever a zombie apocalypse happens. So they're yeah. completely self-sustainable in that point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. All right, Robert, it has been an absolute pleasure having you onto the show. And I'm sure yeah, our audience members are wondering how can they find and connect with you on just how they can find and connect with you. If anybody wants to join, they're more than happy to join. It's called Life as a Diabetic in Facebook. It's mm-hmm. public. I've had numerous members tell me that they would prefer for it to be private, but I don't want it to be private. I want it to be public because I want it to reach people. We've got members all over the world, Malaysia, all over, the United Kingdom, Australia, everywhere. Life as a Diabetic, and we're a family. That's the way... I want it. That's the way we see it. And that's the way we all see each other. We're one big family. Any questions that you might, that you may have, you can, you can ask it there and you'll have a hundred people answering the questions. So you're going to have a variety of answers that you can choose from. But, and if you want to, and if if you want to get in touch with me, more than welcome to private message me on Facebook. I'm always here for everybody. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a dietitian. I'm just somebody that learned based on my own body the effects of what, what I've done. But yeah, if anybody wants to get a hold of me or of the group, it's Life is a Diabetic. We've been around for two and a half years and we're growing. And as I said, science space, nothing mm-hmm. else. Carbohydrates are not the issue. It's our insulin resistance. And our mindset and what we're willing to follow. <laughs> exactly. Patrick. Well said, my friend. Well uh, said. It has been an absolute pleasure again, Robert, and you are a magnificent human being. I'll be sure to put the links and everything for people to check it out on the description below. And of course, everyone stay. I will hope you have a wonderful day and tune in next week for our next episode. So thank you all again for tuning in.